Welcome to our little time to talk about being stream. Uh, thanks for joining me this morning. I'm really excited to be here, my first Elixir Conf. Um, let's start talking with a little story. You can close your eyes and think about that first day at your new job. When you enter the office, you meet your, new, your boss, you meet your new co-workers. And then you get cheated, you get your new brand new laptop, which is amazing. And then they tell you your first assignment. You can open your eyes now. Uh, your, I mean, this is your first day at your new job. So you wanna, you're a bit like tense, nervous. Um, they tell you this problem. There's this company that you're working for, they has a big system that needs to connect to an external database. And and the thing is that they have some parts of the infrastructure that have some issues uh, for, for doing that, that operations. Especially, uh, they're, is, they're experimenting high latency connecting. It just takes too long to get some data. They have socket exhaustion. It means uh, you don't have enough sockets when you need it, so you're opening new sockets all the time. And sometimes you just have bugs, which means that you get responses from things that you're not supposed to. Maybe previous requests, maybe there's some garbage on the socket, you don't know. So you start digging on it, and you find out uh, they're implementing actually a round robin system. They have a bunch of sockets, and they have some position in memory which points to the actual socket that you're supposed to. So the first request asking for a socket will go to the first one, the second will go to the second one, and oh crap, there is something wrong here, uh, the socket gets but, so you discard the socket, you move on, and the next one, and the next one, oh no, again. And eventually you have a, bad, a lot of bad sockets there. So what we normally would do in this situation is, of course, increase the number of sockets. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually you end up in this mess of you have too many sockets open, half of them are bad, it takes just too long to get a good one. And you just end up thinking, like, this is really not working out. Maybe this is not the best way to do a system to connect to a database. And you think, I can do better. I'm going to do this better. Uh, I'm not going to fix the bugs, but I'm only going to um, do a new solution that will make it in half of the time that the one we have. Today, we came to talk about how to optimize code running on the, in the Vim. And some of the things we're going to talk about are OK to do, but others are you really have to think about what you're doing. Because things we're going to talk about are going to make the code way more complicated. And complicated code is bad, OK? But wrong, weird code, not good. But it's also going to be dangerous, because they're going to prevent the Vim from working normally. So give me, uh, I'm going to put a warning. Uh, don't copy paste this as they come from Stake Overflow. Because with great power, which you're going to have today, comes great responsibility. So use them at your own risk. Yeah, better? Yeah. Yes. OK. Let's go on. Who am I? I am Miriam Pena. Um, I've been working in Erlang since 2006. And I have, uh, I think, maybe four or five hours experience in Elixir, which <laughs> happened to be yesterday when I translated all these slides to Elixir for you. Because I, th I was scared of your reaction if I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but I am a super fan of Elixir community, OK? 
I work as a staff engineer in a company called AdRoll uh, Group in San Francisco. And of course, we are hiring. We have a lot of remotes. So please, if you're looking for a job, get in touch. We'd love to have you in our teams. I'm organizer of the Erland and Elixir Meetup in San Francisco. Uh, so when you come to town, let us know. Uh, maybe you want to speak. Maybe you want to just come to our meetups. But I would love to have you there. And I'm founder, I'm a board member, and I'm education chair of the Erlang Ecosystem Foundation, which is a nonprofit uh, that we have founded a few months ago, which is gathering money from companies and bringing that money back to the community to do the things we need. As I said at the moment, I work for Advil, which is a marketing company. Uh, and what do we do? We help our customers grow their customers. We sell ads. So you remember when you go to a website like the New York Times and you have this, uh, ad, and then there's, there's opportunity to serve an ad. Companies like AdRoll receive that opportunity and we have 100 milliseconds to decide whether we want to bid or not. And, and if we bid, we serve the ad of, sorry, that backpack that you love, that you watched yesterday. You're welcome. <laughs> A really wise man once said, uh, Tom Wiseman, we should forget about small efficiencies. 97% of the time, premature optimization is the root of all evil. Real ability and readability are more important in the majority of the cases. Yet we should not pass on opportunities on that critical 3%. When sometimes you need to worry about micro-optimizations, considering from time to time that's not hurt. And when you find a part of the code that you need to optimize, sometimes you need to go for it. And let me tell you why. Uh, this is uh, Valentino, I report to him. He's the CTO of Arrow. In Arrow, we work with one billion unique cookies. We have two million auctions per second, and we have 100 milliseconds to respond to each auction. This is a really tight environment. And that makes us about running our code. Uh, it, that's why it's important for us to run our code fast. Because we have a really tight deadline, these 100 milliseconds. If we don't get there, we, then we get penalized because we stop receiving as many requests as we used to. Uh, and then we don't receive requests, we don't spend money on that, and then my boss gets mad. Um, and also, because at 3% optimization on a system that hands over 1,000 machines actually means that you can hire one more engineer for your team. It's a really lot of money. Or you can have a big party. <laughs> and in the way, when you optimize the code, you use less machines. And that saves energy, which is good for the environment. And we all want to be good for the environment. So optimizing is good. So Erlang and Elixir makes concurrency super easy um, because it doesn't have shared memory. What this means in practice is that when you, a process sends a message to another process, the piece of information that is sent is copied literally from this process to the other process. And this is really cool for modern uh, caches because it makes garbage collection really easy in memory management. Um, of course, I forgot to mention there are some exceptions to this copy. We don't copy atoms, we don't copy big binaries, uh, we don't copy literals, we don't, the code space as well doesn't get copied. Uh, but as I said, this is really great uh, for memory handling. However, all this copying, copying, copying is a really high CPU memory overhead. So, uh, and some of the ideas that we're going to talk today about improving performance are related to the concept of don't copy uh, things when you don't have to. Don't make the interpreter allocate and move data around when it's not necessary. Be smart on what you send. Don't send send small things and don't use abstractions if you don't have to. And if you have to really work with big data, maybe bring the, the function to the data rather than the data to the function. So let's go back to our example, our driver. Uh, we have a few requests going on a pool. And the typical implementation of a, pool like, uh, of a system like this will be to have a pool of uh, co socket connections. Uh, every socket connection will be on its own process, the pool will be a gen server, and you ask the gen server for a connection, and if it doesn't have any available, it will create another process, we will create another pro connection, and it will return it to the caller. 
And then uh, once the client has its connection, it will send the data that wants to send to the socket to the other process, and then we'll send it to Memcache, get a response back, blah, 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 and everything is great. Great model, nothing wrong with it. Uh, life is good, everything's fine, except when it isn't. <laughs> And, and then is when you find this bottleneck, um, you think, okay, so what can I do? What can I do to make this pull faster? And, and the first thing that comes to my mind is to, that sometimes you can avoid unnecessary undirection and layers on, on these critical components. And, and you can avoid a high-level library, which is the gen server. You can just use the process directly. You don't have to use a gen server for every pull thing that you have. Uh, because design principles, like a gen server, are about high availability, about, not about high performance. And we can measure how better this is. How much better is it to use a process rather than a gen server? Uh, and for measuring, uh, remember, measure for a long time, don't do it in the shell, because the shell is interpreted uh, and it has different performance characteristics. Use a wonderful library to measure time, I and mean, Ministat is one of them. And when you find a bottleneck, uh, use tools to figure out where it is. Um, Microstate accounting has been talked a lot. I have never tried it, but maybe that's something you want to try. And the results are, da, 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 da. Uh, it's 80% faster. Yeah, that means uh, if when you do one call with a gem server, you can almost do two calls with a process to get your socket. Uh, I work with a guy called Brujo Benavides, I'm not sure you heard, have you heard from him? He organizes the Elixir Conf uh, Latin America and Spawn Fest. He had really strong opinions about whether we should use uh, processes for this kind of scenario, so he made me put this uh, hard read to read code warning here. That's for you, Brujo. So let's say uh, you, this is not enough, twice as much performance is not enough, there's something else you can do. Have you heard about the process dictionary? Uh, it, it really works um, like Unix processes. Its process has a priority when all the processes, when they start, they have priority normal, and you can increase the priority to high, you can increase it to low, depending on what you want. I, I've seen a lot of companies actually use this, and then stop using it, because... <laughs> Not gonna say who. How this works is that uh, uh, the scheduler will pick up um, first uh, to execute the process with uh, highest priority, and then as long as there are um, processes with high priority, those will be scheduled. So if a new process comes in on high, that will be executed, and normal and low will not have a chance. However, between normal and low, uh, they are intercalated. For instance, right now, a low will be executed, and then a normal will be executed. So this, uh, this is the actual problem. Uh, where if you start moving your processes to high, you can run into the starvation, because the rest of the processes might not be able to get executed on the scheduler. And that's the actual risk. So that's up to you. Things that matter often, that we don't normally talk about, uh, are the order arguments in a function call uh, mother and the order of function clauses mother. And there's a wonderful way to, way to see this, is by looking at the assembly code, which in Ireland you can get very easily by doing this, but in Elixir I couldn't find a better way to do it than do this. And I really want to thank Michael Muscala for having this wonderful library, and he has a really wonderful talk with uh, talks some of these topics, uh, which is called optimizing for the beam. So for instance, if you see this code on the left, uh, order ABCD, which calls order of ABCD D plus one, that's so much better to do than the one on the right, when you reshuffle the arguments. And by looking at the assembly code, you can clearly see that the second option has these four extra instructions, five extra instructions that weren't really necessary. And I want to be clear that this is not even one reduction, it's even less, but it's not necessary, so why would you do it? In terms of the order of clauses, here we have a function called order binary, which is doing a check uh, for its binary or, and then for its list. Uh, and you can see how an interpreter uh, usually puts the first its binary and then the its list. This used to be more the case in the past, it's 
it could happen less and less now. The thing is that compiler pro actually knows a little bit better than you. And for some cases like this, in which you're mixing up uh, atoms and numbers, the compiler might decide that your order might not be the best, and actually decide to do the comparison for atom first, and then the comparison for numbers first. Uh, and this is, this is really funny, because I was looking at this with OTP22, and the new compiler actually removed the test for integer um, on the new version of Erlang. So it's, they're actually working on new optimizations here all the time. Um, going back to our prototype, we have, um, if you want to, going back to our, our rate model, it's a way to avoid uh, necessary processes in the memory that it, that it implies this allocation and the message passing between these processes. It's a simple thing you can do to save some reductions here which is instead of uh, having a process handling each connection, you can have a process creating the connection, but then handling over the socket to the pool directly and not having a process handling each socket. This is, uh, are you understanding this? Traditionally, we have a process handling the socket. You don't have to have a process handling the socket. You can have the socket directly and you can handle the socket directly. And the way to do this is by having a passive socket on raw mode, which actually removes a lot of high-level libraries, but it could work for your case. In this way, when you send the messages to your uh, to your socket, you don't have to you avoid this um, <coughs> memory copy of the data on the process. You just send the data directly to the socket, and also you avoid having to all these extra processes that don't really add too much value. Good practices, lists versus binaries. Um, use binaries as much as you can, use IOLIS as much as you can, use built-in functions and pattern matching as much as you can, because you give chances to the compiler to do all these crazy smart optimizations that he knows better than you how to do. And there is a wonderful option in the compiler, at least in the Erlang called being not info, that uh, will help you print a lot of information on how to debug handling for binary optimizations. And, this, and if this is not enough, you can always go for undocumented, unsupported features that can be removed at any time. <laughs> <laughs> it's being written out there. There is a, call, a function called freeMyNetSyn that, free, uh, that you can use instead of GenUDP, GenTCP for sending data to your socket. And every thread I've seen uh, continues with don't use this, don't use this. But apparently people uh, use it and it's more performant. I've never done it myself. However, I mentioned this uh, just because in OTP22 there's a new library called uh, Socket, and, uh, which is experimental, but it's said to perform just as good as this primanet thing. It's supposed to be really low level, very close to the OS. Uh, so the performance is really amazing. And this is a really great excuse to update your virtual machine version to OTP22 and see how it works for you. And now let's have some fun. Let's say you have a big share, large pieces of data that you don't want to pass around in your functions because it's kind of annoying to have this extra argument that you want to pass around in every function. People will tell you to use ETS to store the data. ETS is a key value storage that you have available. It's wonderful and works, works really well. But forget about it. If you don't move the data away from your processes, there's a automatic version option, which is called the process dictionary. Uh, the process dictionary is really um, a key value thing that you can use to put data on your own uh, process. And the, th the thing is that when you read that data from the ETS, you're actually copying the data from the ETS to your process. So that's an overhead. If the data is really small, like a word, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. If it's really big, like a few dozens or hundreds of elements on a tuple, then it matters. Um, the problem with this, of course, it creates side effects. Uh, bugs are hard to track. So I'm not going to get into that. There's, you have a lot of arguments online if you want inter to get entertained. But it's there. You can use them. And oh, here it is. 
Uh, and you're actually using it already every day because the Presto Dictionary is the place where your ancestors are stored, your initial calls, uh, if you're doing random, they see it's there, and a lot of other things. And I actually benchmark how faster it is to use the Presto Dictionary versus an ETS. And for a tuple size of one, it's two times faster, it means two, two, yeah, two, two more. Uh, but 10 is 5, or 100 is more. <laughs> no good reason to have a tuple of 1,000 elements, but if you want to read 6,000, 60,000, well, I don't know, 6,000 times faster, that's a good option. Of course, uh, you don't always have the process within your the data within your process. Sometimes you want to pass the data to a different process. And for those, if you are really having to use a big sure piece of data, like a big chunk of data, like huge, like a configuration or or information about a client or something, a good way to do it is by code generation. Uh, there's libraries like Mochi Global or Fast Global for this, and the idea behind it is that. Uh, when you uh, when when you copy yeah as I said when you copy data from the stir, uh, from the ETS to your process it gets copied but when you have this big data on uh, the code space then you don't get copied when when you when you use it from your process it's it's reference so you basically the idea is that you put this data on on code on like if you were writing it uh, behind a function and then you compile that function you load it into your system and for getting the data you just call a module and you get the data you don't copy it it just you just have it it's referenced in the code space um, so that's really fast uh, we actually use it for uh, configuration systems sometimes especially because Eventually, one pool is not enough, so you want to have several pools, which is probably what you were all thinking about from the beginning. Like, why would you complicate yourself so much with all these little things? Yeah. So a way to get the right pool is just to have a module to, that generates this configuration, and then you can read uh, uh, which is the right pool for you uh, like this. But there is something amazing that was released on 21.3 called Persistent Term. Uh, and the idea is that... Uh, you can avoid copying, tests, copying the terms and passing them between processes uh, in some cases, in cases when you don't really change the data too much. Uh, persistent terms give uh, you access uh, to Erlang terms in constant time. It's really being highly optimized, uh, no logs, no copy to the heap. You just read the data directly. Uh, the problem with this is that uh, you cannot update the data very often. If what you update is the same size of what you have, then it's f kind of fine. If not, you can possibly trigger a garbage collection in all your virtual machine. So it's kind of a really bummer. <laughs> because it's actually really cool. You want to see how it performs? For a tuple size of one, which means one data, two times faster, again, 2,000. 264 times faster when you have a really, really big tuple. I think for, I forgot to mention that the cover implementation was redone using persistent term and counters, which I'm going to talk about, and it's two times faster uh, now. Another great excuse to update your virtual machine version. And if this is not enough, uh, there's two new cool boys in town to operate hardware level, which are atomics and counters. Have you heard about them? Yeah, good job. Uh, they are low-level hardware atomic instructions, uh, no locking, no costs, operate on 64-bit integers, and they supply highly efficient operations on multiple fixed word size variables. Um, counters is an abstraction on top of atomics uh, with additional optimizations. And the idea is that you can add or subtract things to, to, to a value. And it's, I mean, my favorite use case is uh, to substitute update counters on ETS. ETS update counter versus counter add. Uh, depending on if you are using write concurrency or not, which means uh, with, with atomics, there's two modules to use uh, counters. Uh, if you use atomics, it's guaranteed that if you write A and then write B, you will see either the, when you read, you will see either A or A and B, but you will not only see B. 
However, with write concurrency, you can either see the results of adding B or, or A, on, A on B. In some cases, it's okay for you. So if it is okay for you, then the performance gains is really a little bit much better, 64 times faster. And this is even better on parallel. Uh, it's really mind blowing. And this is pretty much for configuration and big data. And one last thing I want to say, if this is not enough, there's only one more thing that you can do. Um, if you seriously care about performance, maybe then you don't use the Erlang Elixir for performance critical code. Find the bottlenecks, rewrite them in C uh, versus NIF of ports. And of course, rewriting them in C and using a NIF does not really guarantee that your code is going to be faster. It's a lot more you can do. You have to benchmark. Uh, it, it really works better when you're executing something between a 10 and 100 microseconds. Because if it takes too long, you can actually block the, uh, uh, the scheduler, uh, the virtual machine, because it's waiting for the NIF to finish. But if it takes to sort, uh, the overhead of calling the NIF might not even compensate you because of the, oh, compared to the computation you save by writing it in a different technology. Uh, so be careful about load balancing, string memory usage. Uh, my biggest memory leaks I have ever suffered in production were always related to NIFs, and they were really hard to find and track and fix. So in the end, <laughs> you really have to think whether you want to apply all these optimizations. And that's why I suggest you take all of this a bit relaxed. Don't get too crazy. If there is um, one piece of advice I want to take you with you today, is uh, you should upgrade your dependencies of your Erlang OTP version. You should get the biggest one if you can. Um, and we do. In, in our role, we care. We don't, as I say, we don't get crazy about this. And, but we measure performance. Of course, like everyone else, we measure it in production. So I, I bring with me a few metrics of how uh, a grade in your virtual machine versions uh, happen to be. And here you can see the CPU usage of our ad, uh, ad server infrastructure uh, running on OTP 19 versus OTP 20. And you can see almost a 20% improvement. And what this means is that we can shut off 20% 20 of, of the machines that we're using. That's a 20% savings of our infrastructure. That's a lot of money. That's a happy boss. Um, and why happened this? Uh, in OTP20, uh, they did a lot of performance uh, optimizations for large ETS tables. They did performance on the string functionality. The Erlang literals, uh, the numbers, the little things, are not longer copied when you pass them from one process to another. And that saves a lot of computation. So if you want to improve your system, and you happen to be running 19, just update. And same thing for 20 and 21. Uh, 21 uh, uh, bring a lot of optimizations in IO polling. I think this is uh, what actually help us uh, against CPU usage, which is actually mischievous because the, when the scheduler is riddle, it's using CPE and you're really not doing anything. So what you should really look at is about the scheduler usage. And you can see as well that the scheduler usage in OTP 21 is lower. But of course, you will say, oh, it's 20% scheduler usage. This is not really enough. So I, what I did is was put it in the staging and run the scheduler usage on 100% and put as many requests as I could. And there I could actually see uh, that we have, between OTP and 20 and 21, we have, I think, uh, like a 10% improvement of the number of requests the system can handle. You think about it, it's because you can have a bottleneck everywhere. So the, the fact that you use lit CPU doesn't really mean anything for your system unless you can actually uh, increase the work you do. Uh, one of my co-workers, uh, uh, Pablo Volvorin, uh, from, uh, he's, he's really amazing. He, he did a Hack Week project uh, a couple of uh, months ago uh, about moving the real-time building infrastructure of, of Avril uh, to, as well, OTP20. And he also did something else, which is to use persistent term to storing uh, all the configuration of our clients. That means all the campaigns, all the ads um, of our clients. That's a really big data. I'm talking about possibly 
megabytes or gigabytes of data. And by doing this, and benchmarking on as well, uh, the number of requests he could handle with OTP 21 plus persistent term uh, versus OTP 20 without persistent term, it changed on a 35%. He's going to write a blog post about this. It's going to be released in a couple of months, so check it out. He's going to give all the dirty details about how he managed to get that happen, especially because they have the configuration needs to be updated because our client's configuration changes, and that initially causes a drop in performance of the machines. But it's really cool. So remember, upgrade your online version. Going back to our driver example, uh, which is actually a use case, uh, something that is happened in real life. Uh, some of all the changes I mentioned to you were, f uh, were executed on a library called Mero, which we open sourced a long time ago, and it's available there. Uh, I wanted to tell you that I did manage to uh, help uh, fix the Memcas driver, and the performance, I think it was between two and three times faster, and we didn't have any more wrong responses anymore, or weird stuff. So everyone was really happy, and I got the job, yay. <laughs> As a rule of thumb, 95% of your code is run 5% of the time. There's no point in optimizing before you profile benchmark your code. Premature optimizations will likely make your code unreadable, and that is hard to maintain. Clarity of expression should be the principle. So if you decide to go for all of this, there is one last piece of advice I want to give you. You should hire someone else to do your job and then quit your company. <laughs> Thank you.